One of the frustrations I run into when recording is searching for just the right sounds. Percussion elements can be very daunting to sort through. Many times I start auditioning through thousands of percussion sounds and then get sidetracked or lose enthusiasm for the original idea that prompted me to look for the sounds in the first place. Hi, my name is Dave Bodie for Tuts Plus, and in this tutorial series, I'm gonna change that. Instead of searching through library after library for sounds, I'm gonna show you how to record and program sounds that are 100% yours. The advantage of this is that you can create a signature collection of sounds that no one else will have. Throughout this series, you will see how to sample some unique shakers and drums, stick noises and claps, and more special elements for impacts. I'm also gonna go over how to sample some more traditional elements that I like to use all of the time, like cymbal hits, chokes, and cymbal rolls. In this first tutorial, you're going to learn how to sample and program something that I like to call clicky ticky sounds. These are very short, very dry, high frequency noises that work really well layered over other percussion elements. Things like drumstick clicks, brushes on shakers, and chopsticks hitting all kinds of stuff. You will learn how to create five velocity layers in four round robin variations. This is not as extensive as some of the mega libraries out there, but it will be enough to give the sounds some nice realism. And if you wanted to, once you learn the process, you'll be able to create as many layers and variations as you want. I find that the sampling portion is always somewhat of an experiment. I like to capture a bunch of stuff and then save and program only the elements that I feel work really well. I'm gonna be recording here in my office, which is about an 11 by 12 foot area with nine foot ceilings. I have 12 broadband absorption panels in here, so it sounds pretty flat and dead, and this is what I want. I like to record the samples as dry as possible so that I can use them in lots of different types of music. I'm gonna be using a very inexpensive small diaphragm condenser microphone and recording directly into my computer. Once I have finished recording the samples, you will see how to chop them up and program them with a free sample player that works on Mac and PC called Sforzando. I am going to assume that you have some knowledge of recording and editing in a DAW, so I'm gonna move fairly quickly through some portions of this video. I will give you some shortcuts along the way that will help if you are using Reaper, but even if you aren't, you'll still be able to follow along just fine. The next step is to start recording some samples, so let's get started. So I'm recording on my computer and I'm gonna, I'm gonna record a bunch of different stuff here. I'm gonna start with a chopstick here, a bamboo chopstick. I think it's bamboo, some kind of wood, I don't even know. And a stainless steel ramekin here. I'm gonna try and do six or so uh, velocity levels and maybe six hits on each just so I have a little bit of variation here. All right, here we go. So I like to record just a few more variations than I think that I'll need, so it gives me some options when I'm editing. My goal is to create four round robin variations, but I'm gonna record six different samples at each velocity layer so that I can have a couple of variations at each velocity layer in case I goof up one of the hits. You may also notice that I'm recording these samples pretty close together and pretty quickly. And that's because I don't really have to wait for any kind of reverb decay to die down before I go on to the next sample. This helps me make sure that my velocity layers are pretty consistent. If I had to wait one or two seconds in between each hit, it would be much harder to get a very consistent dynamic level. So recording them quick like this works really well in this particular case. I like to record as many velocity layers as I can just to give me some options. That way, if the really quiet ones are just too quiet and too close to the noise floor, I can just use the next dynamic level that I recorded and go with that. This is the general approach that I use to record all of these samples. Occasionally, I had to change the gain on the microphone to make sure I wasn't clipping. And really quickly, I'm just gonna show you some of the other sampling ideas that I tried. Some of them worked and some of them didn't, so check it out.
So here we are in Reaper and I have the file that I recorded all set up here. Now this is actually a comp. I went ahead and deleted all of the blank spots so that I could have a little bit more of a condensed file to work with. So here I have this file. It's about an eight minute long file. It's got a bunch of samples in it and I need to take these samples that I recorded and I need to break them up into some different velocity layers and some different round robin variations. So in Reaper, it's actually pretty simple to do. I'm gonna to come to the beginning here. I turned off my grid because I don't need my grid. And I also turned off my metronome because I don't need that. And sometimes these really tiny samples can be hard to see. So I'm gonna press shift in the up arrow and that's going to kind of expand the size of these waveforms here so I can get a better sense of where the start point is. It's not going to turn anything up. It's simply going to make it larger so that it's easier to see. I think this first sample set here is with a chopstick and a stainless steel ramekin. Let me play a little bit here. So you can see I have some different velocity layers here. Here's like a pianissimo and a piano, maybe a mezzo forte maybe a forte and then a fortissimo over here. And then I have some super loud ones here. It looked like they're clipping, but if I press shift down arrow, they're actually not clipping. So the next thing that I wanna do is create four more tracks to create a total of five velocity layers. And then I'm just gonna rename these here, zero underscore 23. So this is going to be my first velocity layer group. And then I'm going to just copy this, paste it right here. And I'm going to pick up the next one at velocity layer number 24. And then I'll set the high velocity to something like 54. This one will start at 55 and go to, let's say 85. This one will start at 86 and go to, let's say 116. Finally, this is 117 to 127. And this is just kind of a way that I can lay out five different velocity layers. I have my low stuff all the way to my high stuff and I've broken it up so that the very loudest stuff has a very small range. So the loudest stuff, I don't wanna occupy a big part of the velocity layer range because I only want that to be when I'm really mashing on the keys. So I now have my five tracks named with the appropriate velocity levels. The next thing I'm gonna do is set up some regions here. Now, regions are gonna make it really easy for me to line up these samples. So I'm gonna come in here and look at maybe one of these louder samples. And I'm just gonna play it to get an idea of how long I may need a region to be. So what I'm gonna do is press Shift R on the keyboard. That's gonna create a region here. I can alternatively come up here to insert region from time selection, which is Shift R. Now I'm gonna scooch my media item out of the way here and drag my region over here. Otherwise it would slice that portion of time and move that within the region. And I don't wanna do that. So I'm gonna slide this to the beginning here and then I'm going to control click over, make another copy and another copy and finally a fourth copy. So I have four regions exactly the same length. Then I'm gonna come up here to view Region Marker Manager, and I'm just gonna name my regions. And each one of these regions is going to be one of my round robin variations. So I'm gonna pull my clip over here, and I'm going to start trimming these up. Now to make it a little bit easier, I'm just going to slice these and pull them down, each one on their own track here. Just get rid of this guy here. And I have some variations here on the loudest one. And then to speed up the slicing of these, what I'm going to do is kind of generally eyeball these so that I get the first sample about where the start point of the first region is here. And then I'm going to zoom in, make some more space here and then slide each one of these by alt dragging so that I get the start of the hit here right at the beginning of this region. 
and I can do all the velocity layers at the same time here because I know that everything is to the right of this point because I just moved it there. There. Now I'm going to move the cursor right in between these regions, select all these media items, press S to split them, then move the cursor right here to the beginning of this next region, Alt, slide these down, zoom way in here, and then position these exactly the same way so that the very start of each one of these hits is right at the beginning of the region. And then I'll continue lining up the rest of these samples in these regions. Once that's finished, I'm going to put the cursor at the end of the very last region, split all the media items, and then move the excess off to the right, and then trim up the end of the last region. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to trim off the beginning and the end of each little section here. And there's a really easy way to do that. I'm going to make a time selection here. And that's going to snap to the beginning and the end of each region. And then what I can do, if none of the media items are selected, if I hit Shift S, it's going to split all of the items that fall within the time selection here at the beginning and the end. And that's exactly what I want. So now I can select all this jazz here and delete it. Then I'll make another time selection right here. Shift S. Just like that. And now I'm going to come in between these regions here and just clean up the little pieces of clip here that are in between each of these regions. And that should be good. So now I'm going to audition these to make sure that they're all at a pretty good intensity. But before I do, what I want to do is normalize these because they're all just a little bit too quiet. So I don't want to normalize all of them to zero decibels. What I'm going to do is select all the items, go down to item processing and choose normalize to common gain. And what that'll do is take the loudest clip in this selection, turn that up to zero decibels and then turn everything else up by the same amount. And then because I don't want the loudest ones right at zero decibels, I'm going to come back, go to item properties, and then just turn this down by about four decibels to just leave me a little bit of headroom. So now I'm going to audition all these guys to make sure they sound appropriate. All right, those sound good. Those sound good. Those sound great. Sound good. Great. Finally, what I'm going to do is select each one of these kind of vertical groups here, then come up and do a little fade out on each one of these. That's going to clean up the ending of all of these quite a bit. There we go. Now, if I solo this guy, sounds fantastic. Now, all that's left is to render these guys out. I don't need any of this jazz. So I'm just going to delete it. I'm going to hit Control Alt R to bring up the render to file dialog box. Instead of rendering the master mix, what I have it set to is render the stems. The stems are the selected tracks. Right now I only have one track selected. So I'm going to just shift click and select all of these. Then down here under render bounds, it's set to render the project regions. So this is going to render all of the tracks, and then it's going to cut those up into the project regions, which is going to create, as you can see right over here, 20 files because I have five velocity layers and I have four round robins. Four times five is 20. Down here, it's set to 48 kilohertz mono and 24 bit, which is how they were recorded. And finally, I set up the file naming system, which uses these wild cards here. And you can see there's a ton of options. What I have it set to is the track name underscore and then the region name. And you can see exactly how that's going to name the file right down here. Chopstick underscore ramekin underscore zero underscore 23 underscore round robin one. And what that's going to tell me when I go to program these samples is what the sample is, what the velocity range is, and which round robin group number this is going to be. Finally, I'm going to set up the destination here. I'm going to put it in its own clicky ticky folder, and then I'm going to render out all the files. Then if I navigate to that folder, I have all the files right here. They're all the same length and they should all sound fantastic. Now the process for rendering out any other samples that you may have recorded is exactly the same. If you have 
perhaps less round robins, you're not going to use as many regions. If you have less velocity layers, you're not going to select as many tracks. If you have more velocity layers, you probably want to create more tracks and then name your individual tracks appropriately to spread out the velocity range so that you can figure it out when you start programming these into a sample player. Once you've rendered out your samples, the next step is going to be to load them into a sample player so that you can play them back on a MIDI keyboard. The sample player that I'm going to use for this demonstration is the Sforzando Free SFZ player, and you can find that at plogue.com. Now, the cool thing about this sample player is that it's very easy to use, and it's free, which is always really good, and it can be used with various operating systems, Win32, Win64, OS X32, and OS X64. And it comes in a standalone application, a VST plugin, audio units, Pro Tools RTAS, and Pro Tools AAX plugins. So it's got a lot of flexibility. It's a tiny little file and very easy to use. Now, an SFZ file is a plain text file that has a .sfz file extension. And in the file, it contains all kinds of opcodes that determine how the samples will be used. Things like how they'll be mapped in a MIDI keyboard, how each sample will respond to velocity, and many, many other parameters. Now, to program Sforzando, I'm going to use this little application called SFZ ED. I believe this is Windows only, so if you are on Windows, you can go ahead and download this. If not, you're going to have to use another method for programming Sforzando, but that's fairly simple because it is just a text file, and I will show you what my text file looks like so you can get an idea of how to program that way. So let me walk you through this really quick. I'm just going to launch this application here. Now, if you want this to be able to play back any samples or demo the samples that you are now, if you want this to be able to play back or demo any of the samples that you are loading and programming in here, you're going to have to have an additional sfz.dll file here. And that can be a little bit tricky to find because a lot of the links out there point you to cakewalk.com and Cakewalk no longer supports SFZ, but you can find it on the internet archive. So once you have this opened up here, the first thing you wanna do is add your samples, which is this little button right here and you can navigate to where you have your samples rendered. I ended up rendering out a bunch of different samples, but I'm gonna show you just one sample set here to keep things nice and short. The process is going to be exactly the same if you're working with lots of samples, but I'm gonna keep it simple in this tutorial and just work with this sample set right here. So I'm gonna open these up. It's gonna ask me if I wanna create regions. I'm gonna say yes. Then it brings up this little region tools window here, and this is going to be very handy for setting the values for each one of these here. The first thing that I want to do is set the key range. I want to set the low and the high key values here. And if you're not seeing this letter and number combination here, it's probably because the default is set to note numbers here. I find that a little confusing, so I change that to note sharps uh, because that works a little bit better for me. Over here in the region tools box, I wanna first click leave unchanged because some of the changes that we're gonna do if you have it set to any of these other values is going to kind of goof up previous values that you have set here. So if I set this to leave unchanged, that's going to help us as we move forward here. I'm gonna jump over here to the advanced tab, go down to low key, and I'm gonna set the low key to C3. Then I'm going to click apply. I'm gonna select the high key and set this to D3 and then click apply. I like to have all of these percussion samples mapped to at least two keys, and that way I can play rhythms on the keyboard with both hands. And that makes it easier for me. Then I'm gonna jump over here and just select the first four samples here with the velocity ranges from zero to 23. And then over here on the samples tab, I'm going to input the low velocity and the high velocity here, and then click apply. And then I'm gonna select the next group here I'll bring the region tools up for whatever reason it disappears when you set these particular values, but that's okay. 117 and 127. And I'll click apply. Then for the next set here, whoops, I'm going to do 24 and 54. Click apply. 55, 85, click apply. And then finally, 86 and 116. 
there you go. And now we've set up which key these samples are gonna show up on, the low velocity level and the high velocity level. We need to do a couple of other things here. Because I have these round robin variations, I need to come up here to opcodes and select sequence length. Basically, I'm gonna set this up so that it just plays each one of these samples in order, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Then for all of these guys here, I'm gonna select all of them, jump over here to the advanced tab, go down to sequence length and put four. Then I'm gonna add another opcode here. I'm going to add sequence position. Now this one is easier just to input right here into these fields. So I'm gonna click right here and enter in one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Really quickly, just type it in and hit the down arrow and it's very, very easy to do. I'm gonna jump over here and add another opcode. And this one is sample player loop mode. I'm gonna select all of these, come over here to the region tools window, select loop mode, and then set this to one shot. And this will make sure that every time I press a key, it's just going to play the sample and it's not going to get chopped off. I'm gonna click apply here to apply that to these samples. Then I'm gonna add another opcode here. Under pitch, I wanna select pitch key track. And then while all these are selected, I'm going to come over here, select pitch key track and set the value to zero. What this is going to do is not pitch shift these samples up or down so that the samples will play unaltered on C3 and D3, which is exactly what I want. I do not want Sforzando to pitch shift up the samples that are on D3. You can do that if you want, but for percussion samples, that's not what I want. I'm gonna add another opcode here. I'm gonna come down to amplifier and select amp velocity track right here. And then come over here to region tools and then I'm gonna set this to 90. And what this is going to do is apply a little bit of amplitude scaling that corresponds with the velocity. So between velocity level zero and 23, it's going to scale the volume so that there is some volume change there, but I don't want the lowest value of one to be completely quiet. And if I have this at 100, which is the default, when I play the samples really, really quietly, they're completely inaudible and that's not what I want. So a value of 90 or maybe even 95 would work fine here. And that right there is all you have to do to program this. The only thing left to do is to save this. So I'm going to jump into this folder and I'm just gonna name this. Clicky ticky chopstick, and press save. Now, if I wanted to make sure that these were actually working before I load up Sforzando, I can just fire up my MIDI keyboard. And because I have that sfz.dll file, I can make sure that they're working. All right, so this is working. I'm gonna close that. And then I'm gonna launch Sforzando here. I'm gonna come up here to file, go to import. Then you navigate to the folder where you saved your .sfc file. I had it right here, so I'm gonna click open. And now in Sforzando, you can see the samples are working, the velocity layers are sounding great, and the round robin variations are being played in order, and everything's working really fantastically. Now, if you're on a Mac and you can't run SFZED, let me show you what you need to do in order to make Sforzando work. You need to create a text file and name it .sfz as the file extension. And then you need to have this information in here. Basically, you can copy this group information exactly like you see it here. And then for each one of these regions, you need to have the sample and the sample name here, the low key, the high key, and you need to have the low and the high velocity. Now, if the velocity level starts with zero, you only need the high level here. And the same thing with the sequence position here. If the sequence position is one, that is the default, so you don't have to have that. And I'll include this text file here in the project so you can get an idea of what this will look like. 
So let me show you what my full instrument sounds like here with all the samples. I think it sounds really cool, but let me show you what it sounds like in a little composition that I threw together. I have the Sforzando player loaded here as a VST virtual instrument. And let me show you what it sounds like just with the percussion instruments here. This is what it sounds like just by itself. It's pretty busy, but I did want to demo a lot of the sounds that I sampled. So. By itself, it's not super useful, but this works really, really well with some other percussion layers. So check out this shakers layer right here, which is spelled wrong, and this damage layer right here. This was just a really quick example. It took me about 20 minutes to throw this together, but I wanted to show you that this is a really cool way to add some very unique sounds to your collection and sounds that are 100% yours. No one else has these sounds. Now, there may be sounds that are similar to this, but not exactly the same. I have this very unique little collection of instruments here that I can add to all kinds of different genres and compositions that no one else has. That's it for this tutorial. Make sure you check out the next tutorial in this series where you're going to learn how to do some more sampling of some bigger hits and impacts and then program those in contact. Thanks again for checking out this video. My name is Dave Bodie for Tuts Plus and I'll see you around.